As the day is closing on the inauguration of the president-elect, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, focus will be on how he intends to improve and strengthen the sectors that need urgent intervention, from the education sector, power and energy sector, amongst others. Nigeria is the second largest oil producer in Africa as of 2022, and the largest gas consumer and producer in West Africa. In recent months, the country has endured tumultuous production totals to return to form. The country's daily oil production fell from 1.2 million barrels in February 2022 to less than 1 million in August of that year, before rebounding to 1.2 million barrels again in January this year. Today on this show, we'll be taking a look at the oil and gas industry, the Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation Limited, and the achievement of the regulatory bodies. Joining us on this show right now to discuss this and also the conversation around the removal of fuel subsidy is Dan Kunle, energy finance expert and a former senior technical advisor to the former Minister of State for Energy. Good morning, Mr. Dan Kunle. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Good morning, Dr. Adabi, Adaba, uh, Abati. Compliment of the season. Thank you. Profile and Ayo. Morning. Uh, morning. Yeah. Let's, you, let's start like, with the uh, main topic of the day with which we started this program, which is the uh, advice by the National Economic Council uh, that the federal government of Nigeria may not remove uh, for a subsidy by May 29 or June 1, as we had been previously told, and that now what uh, NEC is advising, that other stakeholders should come to the table with the outgoing government, and then a decision will be taken. But that this will require the amendment of two pieces of legislation, the Appropriation Act 2023 and the Petroleum Industry Act of 2021. Well, wasn't this situation foreseeable? Why did the Buhari administration insist previously that they must remove for subsidy removal, when they could see that another government was incoming. Yeah, Dr. Abati, thank you very much. Uh, and good morning to our audience in Nigeria and across the globe. I have said it on this same platform in the past. And if you recollect, I wrote something about three weeks ago where I said that the outgoing government may not be in the best position to administer any serious palliative for this very exercise to end. This regime of subsidy, I've said it, I said it's a regime perpetrated by the elites. It is the elites in Nigeria that uh, perpetrated this uh, petrol subsidy. And if you recall my Maybe about six months ago, or five months ago, I spoke on this matter and I said, petrodollar is the main problem of a developing country like ours that have been endowed with primary commodities. So you, you are battling with petrol, one single product since 1973. You are battling with dollar, one single product since 1973 when you change from pan Stalin to Naira. So now the, the decision of yesterday was not uh, a decision to say don't remove subsidy. No. The decision was a wise decision. It, because the, between now and May 29, if the outgoing government wants to remove subsidy, even the $800 million they have obtained from the World Bank, drawdown and so on and so forth, it cannot effectively be utilized between now and May 29 for Nigerians to see it. And in any case, the incoming government, since it's a continuity of APC, so it is better to allow this old order to just face out, and then you bring the new order. The new order, which I believe is total deregulation, and I believe it will happen. The elites have reached a point of no return. It has become imperative. That is why the Minister of Finance said it is time that the subsidy is removed. 
It's just that it may not be removed between now and May 29. But the, the elites have reached that point that the subsidy has to go. Now, the incoming administration will have to open an agenda. They need to put a team together that will now marshal this so-called palliative that we work out for the citizens of Nigeria. And I want to remind you and the audience that Nigerian Labour Congress is part of the elites. They have never protested against lack of water in their rural areas, in the villages, in local government. Is water not more important than petrol? Is good road not more important than petrol? Is primary health and secondary health more, not more important than petrol? Is primary education and secondary education not more important than petrol? But you will never see these people. In fact, with the new knowledge economy commodity, optic fiber and internet broadband facilities and infrastructure is more important than petrol. Because the knowledge economy of the world, you can sit where you are for one week without going out and you still make money. We are doing it already in Nigeria. In some part of Nigeria, we are doing it. In some segment of the economy where I am involved, we are doing it already. We are making money online without leaving our desk. So I just wonder why Nigeria Labour Congress every time is the issue. They are part of the elites. Some advocates in Nigeria Labour Congress have been part of government. Some even become governor in Nigeria. So I think this regime of subsidy is an old order. And that order has to be closed. And I believe it will be closed by June. We still have good time to put a mashup program in place. So I, I, I'm not too worried. I, but I understand the concerns of Nigerians. And I see their anxieties and expectations. It's because we have been deceived for so long that petrol, petrol, petrol is the one that drives the economy. No, knowledge drives any economy. And good political leadership, good governance, drives any good society. So it's not petrol that drives this country or drives a nation. It's not petrol. All right. It's quality leadership that drives a nation. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Dankoli. And I'm glad that you, you brought in leadership into this conversation with regards to the removal of fuel subsidy. Again, as um, Dr. Babati had mentioned, it is an advice by the NEC, which um, the president could either take or reject. But let me take you back to a comment made by the GMD of NNPCL, um, Mr. Mele Kiari, who had said, who, it takes courage to make this decision, speaking on removal of fuel subsidy. I can share this with you. Only a Buhari regime can make this decision. The reason is very, very simple. People will not appreciate the lost opportunities in a situation where you spend enormous resources. 10 trillion, he said, this was in 2020, in the last eight to 10 years, all, all trying to service that. You also made a statement, so putting that in terms of the leadership, political will to remove, and the faith in this particular administration to bite the bullet. You also mentioned that the elites are the ones who are who benefit more from fuel subsidy more than the masses, and that now they are ready for the remo removal of subsidy. How true is that? Are they really ready for the removal of subsidy? And how do you, did, how did you come to that conclusion that they are ready? OK, thank you very much. Uh, on the issue of the NMPC limited uh, MD's political statements, so those are not scientific statements, and I don't want to dwell too much on those statements. If you take an X-ray, take an X-ray of the global economy, look at carefully the comparative and competitive advantage of nations. When you have crude oil in Nigeria under your ground, under the water, but you don't have the finance, the technology, and the discipline, and the sincerity, the honesty, and good political leadership to produce it competitively. So what do you do? You are at the receiving end 
of the other regions of the world that have built capacity on good political leadership and they produce competitively. So now let's leave this issue of competitive production because we are still coming there. Now, for the GMD to say it's a difficult decision, it's, a, it's all political uh, statement, it's part of the elitism of keeping an empire around petrol. Just petrol, one commodity. So it, why is rice, sugar, not important? To sugar 200 million people is a serious business. So to put rice on the table of 200 million people is a serious business. So now the elites, when I say the elites have come to term, is because the elites, scientifically, they can see the marginal cost of producing a liter of petrol. They can also see the marginal cost of producing a liter of water. They can also see the marginal cost of refining a liter of petrol and the marginal cost of importing it. So recently, you are aware that shipping freight to Nigeria and insurance have gone up. Why? What, what do you think is the meaning of that? It means you are importing inflation. So if you have refinery all these years, and NMPC, the monster, cannot fix those refineries because they just sit in the big building there as clerks. They are all clerical officers who just massage the table and the files. They produce nothing. They can't run refinery. Tell me one transaction, one project that NMPC has done successfully. LLNG is not their success story. Is the success story of the international oil company, Shell, Total, Ajib. They are the owner of 51%. You remove them today, the place will collapse. As we are talking, we are doing only 16 million tons of LNG per year, thereabout, instead of 22 million. Why? So the issue of you questioning me, which I like to say, how sure am I that the elites are really set to remove oil subsidy? I will give you the reason why they have to remove it. We have reached a point that we must be doing proper comparative analysis of what we are doing here if we are part of the global village. What are we doing wrong all these years? And what must we do now to do what is right and move forward? That is why I say the old order, the old order is gone. If you are going to be a player in this modern, civilized, knowledge-driven economy, you must do things rightly at home. You must have good governance. You must have honesty in governance. So once you are able to do things correctly at home, and which I believe the elites have come to term with, and I will prove it, the elites want to see their children participating in the knowledge economy of the world. So the elites cannot sit by and see this country collapse. Because where are we going to go? See Sudan. So it is time the elites reach a consensus, which I believe they will reach. That is why the decision of NEC yesterday was an elitist decision to say, let's tarry a while. Let's put a Masha program in place. Let's put five, ten people in one laboratory or in one room to marshal out what is required. How many buses do we require to run Abuja, for example? How many buses are we going to need the BRT to run Lagos? How many buses will we need to run for Accord? So it is time for them to bring out their asinas, thinking cap, to do this thing. We are not going to leave this business for NMPC Limited. No, NMPC Limited as it is today is just a political company on paper. It's not, a, it's not yet a, a serious company. It's just we are going to reform. NMPC must be reformed completely. The NMPC corporation that is just there now, carrying a lot of baggage every month, salary and wages, compensations, has to be dismantled. So it is a big assignment ahead of us. And sentiment and emotion must be kept somewhere. So my dear sister Ayo, there is a challenge in our hand. So we are not going to over-politicize these challenges, sentiment, tribe, religion. 
Where does that take anybody to? You need bread and butter on your table. You need safety around the country to drive about and to go in the railway. So uh, I, I think it is, I, I have sufficient evidence to know that the elites have come to term that subsidy has to be removed. Okay. Like when you were talking, there are even many other things we can look at. Uh, you were talking about other things apart from crude oil, the oil, the mined economy. Common oil palm is more profitable than crude oil as we speak today. Oil palm is more profitable. But this, you know, uh, leash on the oil sector is because petrodollar is quick dollar. And it doesn't bring up a lot of rigor. Just get it out of the ground, sell it, you get something in response. And it's quick dollar. Dollar people can just quickly make. You don't need to think too much. You don't need to do any work. You just have partnership with international IOCs. They come in. They even do the work of extracting for you. You just sit back there and get royalties. You don't even need to develop capacity. And that's why this scam has been going on since 1973, Yom Kippur War. The question is, because we are setting an agenda for this new administration, what would you say your agenda should be for this new administration on gas, number one, and number two, thinking of other ancillary sectors? Because, you see, in all of this talk, we have not even explored petchem, petrochemicals, industry, that can even make you more money than crude oil extraction. All we've done in this country is extraction. We've never talked about pet chem. That's another sector entirely that can make you many more billions. I mean, the camera that is videoing me now is made with petrochemical substrate. Everything in the world is pet chem substrate. This uh, wire on my microphone is pet chem substrate. How can we set an agenda for this incoming? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rufai. I, I, very critical question. The, uh, look, I, I, I want to dimension some of these things from historical perspective. When the Dutch FIFA caught up with Nigeria, Udoji, 1974, all over the place. OK, we were in school. And the, 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 the fundamental error was like you get used to drinking Coke. And you, every time you must drink Coke. The global economy got petrol to drive the automobile industry. That was the uh, uh, revolution or the evolution stage of industrialization. Now, Nigeria was caught in that same evolution, or let's say revolution. Now, when we were giving almost free concessions, when I read the Mining Act, the oil ordinances, Shell, all of them were getting almost, almost free leases. Almost. We were like begging them. Now, look at the turnaround of this same hydrocarbon search in the world. Nigeria is sitting on reserve of about 37 billion. But see how the same international oil company that came here to open it up for us, see how they have succeeded in migrating out gradually. So we have reached a stage now that you must sit down and watch that where are they living? They have all gone all over the world with advanced sciences to find oil. And they are extracting those oil cheaply. See Guyana. See Namibia, see Mozambique, see even the Côte d'Ivoire here. So now Nigeria, we are still behaving like the big boys of the 70s, 80s, 90s, when the international oil companies were coming with big, big briefcases to line up in our offices. Today, no, no international oil company will sit down one hour to wait for any executive in NMPC. If he goes there on appointment and they don't give him, he goes away. Because he has all that cheaper alternative to invest his money. So since we did not build capacity over this year, in the last 40 years, internally, to internalize our endowment, that is why 
they have other cheaper alternative in the world. That is why we are in this mess with our crude oil. On gas, when we, were, we, we embarked, we started with President Obasanjo to say, how do we monetize gas? Then from there, I flew from BP. I became part of the Ministry of Energy, newly created. And President Yaradwa said we should build the gasification of Nigeria, that he wants gas monetized. So my minister was charged to develop the gas master plan. And yesterday I was very happy when I saw Dr. David Gay, one of our colleagues, uh, writing a book on the, the, on the natural gas uh, concept in Nigeria. Now, if gas that is hugely available here, we have more gas than oil, I don't need to repeat this, we cannot even transmit gas successfully to Ajakuta to power Gregu 1 and Gregu 2. These are two power plants built by Siemens. We don't have sufficient gas to even give to Dangote cement factory in Obajana near my village there. Dangote has to convert part of his turbine to coal. So that is the kind of country we have been running. We sit on wealth, but we refuse to put good governance and sincerity of purpose to make it productive. The elites just share the dividend of what the international oil company declared to us. And the elites just go to offices to defend their office. They don't go there to say, how productive can I make this office and add value to this society? Take this gas issue you just mentioned now. See, the gas pipeline that was to go to Kaduna in the 80s, President Shagari of blessed memory, they were to take gas from Ajakuta because they took gas to Ajakuta for the power plant there to power Ajakuta steel complex. That gas pipeline was to go to Guagulada near Abuja here for a fertilizer factory phase two of NAFCON. That gas pipeline was to go to Cardinal refinery near there and another petrochemical as you just mentioned. Petchem, Petchem is one of the most versatile source of money making. I was involved in the privatization of LMA Petrochemical. When we took over LMA Petrochemical in BPE, I want you to use this as a case study in this country if you have enough time. NNPC could not run LMA Petrochemical Company. It was built with about 1.2 billion US dollars. And we took it over and handed it over to Indorama. Today, Indorama is tuning out fortunes from LMA Petrochemical. They've gone to urea ammonia. They've expanded the polymer plant three times. And NMPC and BP, they are any dividend every year, handsome dividend. So we need petrochemical in 10 places. We need methanol because we have huge gas. We need LNG in five places. So, but if you don't have the right framework, if you don't have the right team to develop all these things, we will just continue to talk like this. Somebody said, are you not tired of talking? I said, no, until I drop dead. I will not stop talking. Because the holders of knowledge must set a society right. And I think I hold some reasonable knowledge about the global affairs. So I must continue to talk about gas. I must continue to talk about sectors that I have fairly good knowledge. So, so that I can contribute to setting the society right. So I don't need to hold political office before I talk. That is why I enjoy the activities you people have been doing. The trending issues in the world, we should participate because we are part of the global village. So I think it is time for us to decouple gas, to go back to your answer. We should decouple gas from oil because gas is the one that runs the world. See what it has done to Germany. Germany, all the petrochemical industry in Germany run on gas. After, I was joking with a, an European guy, after the air, water, the next most important thing in Germany is gas. Air is the natural thing God gives all of us, water. The next thing is gas. Because all bus, uh, in, uh, all the petrochemical companies in Germany, who is, they, they live on gas. So you are very correct. America live on gas, DuPont. 
So what, what are we talking about? So you are very correct. We need to rejig the whole system that surround the hydrocarbon industry and also other sectors. But since we are focusing more on this now, we need to rejig it. And that is why the new regime, the new government that is coming, so please avoid politics over politicization and sentiment so that we can really refocus and re-engage government all over the world, G to G, and no, beg the Mr. international Kunle. oil company to come back and, and join us to, yeah. But Mr. Kunle, well, we've been discussing oil and gas, but you know, I want to add some other elements to this conversation. But before I do so, just two quick comments. Uh, you, you may not respond to that, but it depends on you. Number one, is it possible that the Nigerian government is now talking about suspending the removal of subsidy because they are waiting for the Dangote refinery to come on stream uh, later this year so that they can use that as a more concrete excuse because they've always been saying, oh, when the Dangote refinery is there, when the Dangote refinery is there. And then two, you were talking about NMPC reform. Isn't the whole thing about NMPC uh, about reform, about transformation? This is what, uh, you know, the... Uh, leaders at the uh, NMPC have been talking about, that NMPC is already going through reform and transformation. But I wanted to ask you about two other big issues that the next administration may have to deal with. One is Ajaukuta. Who or what is the devil in Ajaukuta Steel Company? That uh, company has taken over $450 million from Nigeria. Now they are talking about concessioning. Is that something that should also be suspended? By the end of this uh, month, the Ministry of Aviation is saying that Nigeria Air will come on stream because they are just waiting for approval from ICAO. Airline operators of Nigeria are saying they should perish the thought, and they've gone to court. That is not in the best interest. So are these two other issues that will need to be suspended to allow the new administration to worry about them? You may start with uh, either of the two major issues. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abati. The, um, I, I remember I wrote uh, an open memo in 2017 on this issue of uh, uh, subsidy suspension or the, the coincidence of Dangote refinery uh, coming to the mainstream supply and the Rekitia, the Rekitia three leftover government refinery in Nigeria. I call them Rekitia because in chemical and process engineering, some of those refineries have been left for too long. That to fix them properly, uh, I'm sorry, the corrosion has done so much that the integrity of those plants are long gone. So all the money they are spending there now, as long as they will still be run by government agencies, they will never function. So, and the body is going to fall on Dangote refinery. So if by coincidence, Dangote refinery can come to production before the end of the year. Good enough for the new regime. So at least they will have a sort of guarantee supply of certain million liters per day for the domestic market. Another problem will be, I hope Dangote will get guarantee supply of crude at a good price. So let, let's leave that one. So now, if this outgoing government is intentional or, or unintentional, saying, oh, let's delay so that maybe Dangote can come, that means they are aware of certain things going on around Dangote refinery. That may, maybe they have calculated, oh, it will come to production by July, August, or September. So that means they are aware. But as I have said, it's still largely the level of ineptity in NMPC that led in the, in the then NMPC, and even the new NMPC Limited is of nothing. It's just a kangaroo arrangement for now. So it, it is good for us to really see that why did the old NMPC, why did they leave all those refineries to decay? And now they want to shift all their body now to Dangote refinery. So it's good enough, but don't let me overflow that issue. It will be a good coincidence. I hope the pricing regime will be right. Uh -huh. And I hope the supply level will be fairly reasonable.
supply security is very important. So I, I think it's going to be a rescue uh, situation for Nigeria. Otherwise, our import will go continuously like this. Because I said it in 2017. When I wrote that memo, that the, 10, the 10 reasons why I said the then Minister of State for Petroleum should resign, I, it was there. I mentioned Angote Refinery and the, the level of ineptitude in NFC. So you can Google it, it's still there. So to go back to the issue of Ajakuta, I think Ajakuta is still complex. It's still part of the same old order political decisions. When Ajakuta, I worked on Ajakuta, I, I held one week seminar in Ajakuta in 1995 to look at how it can be re-engineered and how we can work hard to complete it. Unfortunately, pre, uh, the then military head of state, Abadja, took a decision to, to, to exit the Russians. So, and till, the, till this moment, Ajakuta is stranded. Now, because Ajakuta is still complex, it's a limited liability company. Neomco is a limited liability company. That is Nigerian National Iron Ore Mining Company in Itakwe. These two, they, they co-ate because Itakwe is to give iron ore concentrate to Ajakuta and Delta Steel. But the two are stranded. Now, the Obasanjo regime, the Minister of Power and Steel, as it was called then, concessioned this thing to soil gas, concession Ajakuta to soil gas. The concession was not successful. Then it transferred to Global Steel. When we were trying BP to regularize and legitimatize that concession to Global Steel, going through proper privatization so that they can pay for share, Yaradwa regime came in 2027. It's good Nigeria to know this history. When Yaradwa regime came in, BP could not conclude that share purchase agreement privatization. Late Albert Okumagba, BGL, was the privatization advisor. So then I moved to Minister of Energy. So Global Steel was handed over Itakwe. And the rail line, because it's an integrated steel complex, the rail line and Ajakuta. Then they were there. Yaradua regime, somehow, somewhere, they said everything was done to favor Obas and Joe's fingers. The same thing they said about the refineries. I will still come to that. Then they cancel the concession. So the concession that was canceled or frustrated led the Indians, the, the global steel, to go to arbitration. Because if you were going to exit them, you should exit them through uh, the contract uh, agreement reached in the concession. So rule of law again, you see we are back. And that matter dragged, meanwhile, Ajakuta still have not been put to use. So we are back to square one. They have gotten good award from the arbitration. And now this government have paid them handsomely. I have no grudges against them, but I have grudges. And we need to interrogate the process since that time that that contract was frustrated. All the principal officials that were involved and the country has to lose that money. As at the time we were attempting to privatize Ajakuta, the amount federal government had spent on Ajakuta was about five billion Dutch mark. Which, when we translated it that time, it was about just about four billion dollars. So since then to this time, take another one billion dollar that has gone to Ajakuta. So that's about five billion dollar has gone to Ajakuta than the drain. And it's a limited liability company. You cannot produce steel politically. You can only produce steel when you have all the economic apparatus and the infrastructural framework right. So other places in the world have built capacity in steel production. So there is excess capacity in steel production all over the world already. So that complex is not viable. It was politically done. We can make it viable by hard political decision. Liquidate the place, give it to the Chinese or the Indians who have done very well in steel and ask them to dredge River Niger and to make the railway to work. Just liquidate it. All this sentiment and emotion attached to Ajakuta steel complex 
It's all wrong sentiment and emotion. It doesn't bring bread and butter. Liquidate it, ask the Indians or the Chinese to please take it. So that is about Ajakuta. It is not whether one devil or Satan is there. It is the wrong political handling. Okay, they have gone to embark on another concession. That is another preparation for another litigation. I will beg the new government to stop it. In fact, this outgoing government should stop that concession. I'm aware they appointed privatization advisor or concession advisor. All those again are part of the of the wrongs. Don't let me say part of the of the of the the the, 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 the ignorant, fraudulent approach to handling transactions. Because you cannot continue your concession before, you cancel it, you are paying a word to somebody. You again go back to, to say concession. When you told us seven, six years, eight years ago that Ajakuta will be completed, how will you complete Ajakuta? I betted with somebody on WhatsApp that it will never be completed by this government. I betted about three years ago. Because I know what I'm talking about, I'm a student of steel. I know where every steel plant is in the world. I know how steel was used to build America. So it, it is time we call a spade a spade. And I believe the new government will put the right team together. The right team together. To yank off some of these cancers. And let us harness our resources to build education, good health. Send children to okay. good school. Uh, Mr. Kule, we're Give trying, them good we're education, to, science. Mr. Kule, so please, we're yeah. trying to okay, thank you. Time. Very quickly, Nigeria Air. Okay, sorry. Should they also suspend that? Or did Nigeria Air, yes. I, yeah, no, please. I, I, I was part of the team, committee of inspection. Go to the court, you see my name there, that liquidated Nigeria Airways. It is the same poor management, poor leadership that destroyed Nigeria Airways. We went all over the world to look for the engine of one aircraft or this or that. Nigeria Airways was mismanaged from 32 aircraft to only two. I knelt down for a public officer in Nigeria to beg him to allow the last two aircraft to fly because there was no insurance. I said, please pay this insurance so that they can still fly. The very week we were appointed to liquidate Nigeria Airways with late Babinti Asai of blessed memory. So if I see a new Nigeria Airways is coming with a strong technical partner that will be allowed to run it, I may not object because see Ethiopia Airlines, what they have done. But where will we raise the money? This is my question. And will we allow Nigerians again who have not changed attitude, who have not built up good managerial skill, will we allow them to run it? If it is technical partner that will run it, I have no objection. Because the aviation industry, we have seen what it has become now. You can see Dubai, you can see Qatar, what they have done. So it is neither here nor there. It is still the question of honesty and managerial skill. This country, we lack managerial skill. We lack discipline. We overlive. We overdress. We over we overbuy cars. Our excesses are reckless. All right. So. If MD of Nigeria Airways can just wear a t-shirt to do the work, I will be happy. The new Airways. Right, if he will that. bring expertise, I will be happy to see it happen. But as long as all these baggages we have been carrying from our childhood is still in our DNA, I will not support that we put public money there. All right, Mr. Collins. So this is my submission. Thank you very much for your submission. Very clear as to your stance on this. And thanks for sharing with us from your wealth of experience. Still tapping from that wealth of experience since we're on analysis and just uh, looking at how some projects or sectors have been handled. You've touched on Ajaokuta Steel, you've talked, touched on the refineries, you've touched on Nigeria Air. Let's talk about NNPCL. You know, in the course of your conversation, you have sort of dismissed NNPCL almost as if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. How would you analyze NNPCL at least or NNPC before it became PCL, in the last, say, four years, this current administration. And side by side that, the Ministry of Petroleum, with the Minister of Petroleum being the president himself. You've also been looking ahead in terms of setting an agenda for the new administration. It would be good to see if there's some lessons to learn from the old to take to the new in terms of whether to ditch or to continue with into the new administration. 
Yeah, thank you very much. The, um, I, I, I did not just wave the NMPC Limited aside. It's because uh, people, you cannot reform yourself. NMPC was NOC, I think 1973 when we were in secondary school. I think it was National Oil Corporation, something like that, if I remember my economic history very well. So it, it has not done very well. I will give you one project that was so dear to my heart because I live in Kaduna. The Kaduna refinery, the crude pipeline from Escravo to Kaduna was carrying two types of crude, the light crude, or intermediate crude, and the heavy crude from Basra, Iraq, or Iraq. Venezuela, because Kaduna has a linear alkaline benzene plant. So that's a petrochemical unit and paraffin wax and so on and so forth. So now, the, that project has never returned profit. You cannot even pressurize crude to that place. I don't know for how many years now, 20 years. When we attempted to privatize it to the Chinese, they said they will not take crude from that pipeline because they, do, they are not sure of the integrity. That they will build their own pipeline from Niger to that place. I am sad that that transaction did not happen. So NMPC is not that I wave it aside. The only organ of the new, of the new Petroleum Industry Act that we can look onto to help us uh, rearrange the industry is the regulatory arm, because that one is properly set up now. The commission is there. But the NMPC Limited, if you look at it, the, the regulators need a new job to be done. They need to rearrange the industry and help the industry with a lot of regulations. And I think, to the best of my judgment, they are doing well, because it's very difficult to regulate. An industry that is already so mature and badly managed. If you are a new regulator with new law, you need a lot of time and patience to babysit and, re, and, and maybe rebat that industry. So the upstream sector of the petroleum industry has been destroyed. 2005, IO, we were doing 2.5 million barrel check from DPR, which is the NUPRIC now. 2.5 million barrel per day. Onshore, late 2005, Bonga offshore project came to life. Then like that, like that, Apple, then Eugenia. So then, like joke, this country moved from onshore, production has dropped to maybe three, 400,000 today, onshore. While offshore has peaked to almost one million. So why that, why that? Poor management from NMPC. NMPC, as far as I'm concerned, are the ones who have put this country in this problem because they are the ones earning the largest revenue for us. So it, I, it, it's not, it, we shouldn't shy away from all these things, but we pretend a lot because we want political office. So I will talk sweet so that I can get political office. When I'm there, I will be hailing the man who put me there while I'm supposed to do the job. So I think what we need is let us see how far the regulator can go. But let us now work hard to reform NMPC Limited properly and make it a viable company. I suggested here once that this government, outgoing government, to hire my brother and my good friend from Kaduna, Malam Nasri Rufai, to do the reform for them. But people thought I was just talking to flatter Nasri Rufai. No, he's my, I, we talk frankly to one another. So I know he's the one who can do that job. There are many other people who can do the job, but okay. So it, we must now reform an MPC because as it is there today, it's just a political kangaroo. Yes, the president is the minister, but what are the quality of information they give to Mr. President? He's a very honest man, very honest man. So it is, it is the way we have run this country. Everybody is building empire for himself. When we're supposed to build the cake big for all of us, People build cake only for themselves okay. from our national wealth. Okay. It cannot, it's not sustainable okay. and it must stop. Okay. Okay, real quickly, and that just typifies the God of small things. As we start to wrap up this conversation, I want to talk about the state of our wells. 
most of those JVs and NPC are part of in places like Sapple and other places, and some that the NPC themselves have prevailed over the necrosis, and I use that word advisably, of our oil wells and even production capacity. Recently, NMPC also said they were pumping money uh, in, into refinery in Port Harcourt to rehabilitate that. One wonders, why is that the refinery is not back on stream yet? And this same refinery worked effectively when Shell Daisy set it up in 1965 in this country. And it ran and it produced oil. One wants to also talk about the condition of Delta Steel Company in Onwea, in Alaja. That was supposed to even be the main reason why the Wari Takbe rail line was done, because that was also to carry materials from uh, steel plants to Onwea in Alaja, from Onwea in Alaja to around the Takbe and those areas. So, what is happening to all of those infrastructure? And if you can also talk us through the moribund nature of our industries today. Michelin plant was employing over 40,000 people in Port Harcourt. It's gone. Dunlop, that used to produce here in Nigeria, now imports tires into Nigeria. When you go to a famous industrial place in Ilukbeju, it's now warehouse everywhere. What's going to be your advice for the new administration to revive industry? And all the other points I've made, sir, as we wrap up. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rufai. So many, so many cross-cutting issues. The um, upstream, all our production wares, the joint ventures. Okay, good enough. We had joint ventures where Nigeria was senior partner, 60, 40. And we had joint ventures where we were 55, 45. Okay, all those JVs were poorly managed. Let us not go into the details of how they were managed. Those are the nitty gritties that will come out soon. They were poorly managed. Nigeria, we were taking the proceed, the, the revenue, the dividend, and we were consuming it and living very flamboyant life. We were not financing our capital contribution, CAPEX and OPEX. So we now had accumulated recoveries. That is the, the our junior partner, 40% owner, who was the operator of those fields, when they put the bill on the table and say, oh, yeah, pay your own 60% or 55%, we were not meeting our obligations. We were using our money, our revenue there to finance budgets, to live flamboyant life. So now what happened was that we now started owing JVs account. So the IOCs were discouraged that, look, the senior partner is not putting the money on the table. So I will use my 40% to finance you. So I will now add interest over LIBOR. LIBOR is London Interbank Offering Rate. So we were now under a debilitating debt. So, and some of those JVs, the IOCs started working out of it. So that was what happened. So I think uh, more revelation will come in the near future, when somebody sit down to check the JV's account, I, I hope somebody will do that. So, because those well today have aged. They have aged because well must be maintained. It's not, you don't drill well and pump, pump, pump and just abandon it. No, you must maintain the rigs, you must maintain the casing, you must maintain the pressure. You, it's, it's expensive. Those are OPEX. So now you have less well and less rigs that are active. America can't rigs every hour. How many rigs are working? Nigeria, I don't know how many rigs are working. The upstream sector will tell you. These are the work now that the upstream sector is trying to do, the upstream commission. I think they have a lot of work in their hand. I hope they can concentrate for another one to two years to get that one done. They need to do inventorization and check the technical integrity of all the upstream wells all right. that are producing onshore. You see, these jobs are not small yes. because you need technical expert that will not be biased or that will not be compromised. And so you have to find them somewhere to do the job for you. Well, Mr. So Dan until Kule. we do that before we really know whether, yeah. 
Sorry. Mr. Duncan, we are out now of let time me, now. Can you quickly, just round yeah, off? Yes. So, okay. just sorry, on the Delta still. On the Delta still. Very sorry. On the Delta still. You Delta have a minute, still, please, sir. If you can just wrap Morris that up in one minute. Said. Okay. Okay. Delta still will have been the most viable steel plant in Nigeria because it's near the sea. So you can bring heavy materials from Brazil, from anywhere to convert to steel metal products there. But unfortunately, again, the same Nigerian factor is what brought Delta Steel to the state in which it is today. So I think it's in receivership. All I right. think the place have gone down. I'm okay. not very sure of the status. But this is all sad story. But we have good story. If the incoming government can sit up and use professionals Absolutely. and manage this country scientifically with less politicization of public Wet. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Dankunle, you for your time and for breaking things down so well this morning. Mr. Dankunle is an energy finance expert as well as a senior technical advisor to the former Minister of State for Energy of the Federal Republic of Nigeria.